Hello, let me come over here and just double check that the sound is here. Hello. It's supposed to be transmitting. I'm double checking here to see if it's here. Hello. Hello. It says that it's live, but I don't see or hear anything. If anybody is with me, type it in that you can hear me or see me. Huh. It shows that it's transmitting, but It appears to be frozen. Huh. It says live, somebody is there. Hi, Scott, can you hear me? Can you get anything at all? I'm watching it and it's frozen here. You can hear me fine. Well, this is very strange. I cannot, I, I'm putting it here. I, I, what I started doing because of having some sound problems, I thought, well, I will start double checking here to make sure that I can hear it. And so I'm looking at the live stream. I cannot, I, I'm okay now. I, I, what I started doing because of having some sound now I got it. Okay, good. Thank you, Scott. I don't know. I don't know why this thing goes goofy like this. So anyway, so far it's you and me, but that's kind of what I expected. You know, this these things usually are viewed on the archive. So here we are, you and I. And uh, I will put on, we're on the Bhagavad Gita, we're in chapter nine, which is the royal and secret path or something like that. And we're just picking up where we left off. And uh, let's see if this works, okay. Even those devotees of other deities who sacrifice endowed with faith they too, O son of Kunti, sacrifice to me alone, even though in an inappropriate manner. In other words, those who do not understand that, that, that Krishna is speaking as a symbol of Brahman, the absolute reality. So those who don't understand the deeper things, uh, even though they, something comes to them. I alone am the receiver of the offerings of all sacrifices 
and I alone am their master. However, they do not recognize me as such, and therefore they slip from reality. And of course here, the capital R reality means the absolute oneness of Brahma. And that's what Krishna is speaking as a symbol of in this poetry. Those whose vows are directed towards gods go to the gods. And of course, the idea of the gods is meaning with form. So if one is directs themselves towards form, they move towards form. Not really very surprising, is it? Uh, those whose vows are addressed to the ancestors go to the ancestors. Those who sacrifice to spirits go to those spirits. Those who sacrifice to me come to me. Hello, Roseanne. In other words, those who those who turn to me as a symbol of the one non-dual absolute reality generally called Brahman, will come to that self-realization. That's the spirit of that. And Swami Rama says, in any way one worships, whether it be to any god, deity, or other aspects of Brahman, he, in fact, worships Brahman alone. And here, worships means turns attention toward all worship, ritual, and prayer are offered to the one Brahman only, for Brahman alone exists without a second. There is nothing else other than Brahman. All the reverence and respect shown by the worshiper is actually shown to Brahman. But the ignorant who do not recognize Brahman fall back to the world because of their ignorance. A worshiper identifies himself with the worshipped one. And I'll note here that in the commentary that Swami Rama is making, this is why it's useful to note, to be aware, that there are literally thousands of commentaries on the Bhagavad Gita and different people have a different orientation. The orientation of this tradition and what we're looking at is that this is poetry and, uh, and that it is, a, it is a symbolic story telling the practices of yoga and philosophically rests on the foundation of one absolute non-dual reality without a second. Some other commentaries, translations and commentaries on the Bhagavad Gita view this in a way similar to the way probably the majority of Christian sects view the Christian traditions and Bible where it is about worshiping the teacher. And so it's all about the one teacher and, and him rather than being a symbol. Those who worship spirits identify themselves with the nature of spirits, where those who, whereas those who worship Brahma identify with the nature of the Lord, meaning Brahma. When a student starts seekings, he wants to try all the methods of sadhana mentioned in the, in the scriptures. Hello, Hashim. Uh, he does not have the patience to steadily practice one path but changes his path every now and again. And hi, Johnny. Hi, Joe. Boy, I almost missed who was showing up. There's Joe. And there's Johnny. And there's Hashim. And then there's Roseanne. I'll just make that there. <clears throat> Some of the ignorant ones even worship spirits because they do not have the knowledge of the absolute truth. These verses contain a warning to all seekers that they should carefully understand the various paths. There's Rojo. Hi, Rojo. You must be registered into your hotel room. Rojo is down around Orlando meeting up with her family to go to Disney World and play games, I guess, or something. These verses contain a warning to all seekers that they should carefully understand the various paths and select the pure and clear path that leads to Brahman alone, which is the orientation of what we're doing when we go through this. 
it is important for aspirants to select a valid and profound path so that they reach the highest Brahma. Now note here that not everybody would agree with these couple sentences here. Those who are seeking the spirits will not read a text like this because it doesn't speak to them. Fun. I guess Scott is talking about fun at, you know, you mean fun seeking Brahman, huh? Or do you mean fun at Disney World? See, there's, there's, there's the core dilemma. Do we seek Brahman or Disney World? Or, or do we seek Brahman and sometimes play at Disney World? At the hotel. Rojo is at hotel. There. Rojo at hotel. It is important for oops, a competent teacher or yogi can help the student select the, the best path for him to follow. And I'll note here also in alignment with that sentence that every one of us naturally finds our way to what seems to be, you know, home for us individually. So uh, most of the people who end up here with us in these satsangs are hanging out in one way or another have already decided that there's something to this oneness and self-realization and are going that way. All righty, so let's scroll down here. Whoever offers me a leaf, flower, fruit, or water with devotion, that gift of a person of controlled self offered with devotion, I accept. Whatever you do, sacrifice, or give, whatever austerities you perform, O son of Kunti, surrender that as an offering unto me. Thus you will be freed from the bondage of bondages of actions whose fruits are helpful or beautiful or ugly. Yourself, united in the yoga of renunciation, liberated, will reach me. Okay, Roseanne, say free. And where is my tree? The Lord accepts any offerings, no matter how insignificant, even a leaf, flower, fruit, or a small amount of water if it is given with full devotion. This does not mean that aspirants should use only these objects for worship. It means that which is important is the feeling of devotion. The Lord does not need anything, for everything already belongs to him. And note here that Swamiji is here being consistent with the storyline by using the word him. Brahman is actually, of course, not a him or a her or an it. It is everything, all in one or something. There we go. There is there is a free. And there is Scott with another free. Now we're getting some frees. Those who offer the fruits of their actions to others without any selfish motivation, no matter how big or small the fruits, are making offerings to the Lord. Boy, what is all of that, Rojo? Look at all those little flowers. There's those little flowers. Well, I guess that's all the offerings, huh? Leaves, leaves flowers, and fruits. Well, it's a little hard to keep up with all of these comments here. Huh? Learning to give is a great virtue. It is as good for oneself as it is for others. By offering fruits, one learns giving and is benefited in two ways. He practices non-attachment and, and acknowledges the presence of the Lord in others. Thus, giving is a step toward non-attachment and at the same time acknowledges the presence of God in all beings. Verse 26 teaches the aspirant to give or offer whatever he can according to his capacity. Those who acquire this habit cannot stop giving, and finally they give all that they have as an offering to the Lord. 
giving and giving up bring one and the same result. These two virtues are the highest of all and help the aspirant in self-unfoldment. Any selfless action performed is a devotion to the Lord. When the aspirant dedicates everything to the Lord and directs all his energy with mind, action, and speech to the Lord alone, his actions and the fruits of his actions no longer bind him. Actions performed as worship to the Lord do not create bondage. Great men solely dedicate their lives and perform all their actions for the selfless service of mankind. They do not ever experience bad or good fruits of their actions because they live for the service of the Lord performed through service to mankind. I am alike to all beings. No one is hated or beloved of me. However, those who devote themselves to me with devotion, they are in me. I am also in them. Even if a person of very bad conduct devotes himself to me following no other, he should be considered only saintly. He is embarked on right determination. Very quickly, he becomes a person whose self is virtuous and attains eternal peace. O son of Kunti, do know for certain, my devotees do not perish. Making themselves depend on me, of course, me again being absolute reality, making themselves dependent on me, even the lowly born, as well as women, traders, servants, reach the supreme status. Now, don't the women get, please don't get too excited over this verse. Remember, this was written in a different time in a different culture. And so, but the spirit of it is, is valid. So there's, there's nothing in this, in our, in our perspective, in this tradition or anything that I know of that is looking down, you know, here, even the lowly born, as well, the lowly born, as well as women, traders and servants. Everybody, in other words, how much more so the meritorious Brahmins, the devotees and royal sages. Having come to this transient, unhappy world, do devote yourself to me. Sri Krishna continues teaching Arjuna that the real self remain, maintains an attitude of evenness toward all beings. The Supreme Brahman is never partial in any way. It has neither hatred nor favor for anyone. The aspirant who devotes his life to Brahman alone remains in Brahman consciousness, and Brahman dwells in him. When the yogi attains the height of tranquility beyond body, breath, senses, and mental consciousness, and maintains constant consciousness of Brahman within himself, he realizes that there is none who is a friend to him and none whom he can none who is a friend to him and none whom he can hate. For he has gone beyond the pairs of opposites and has attained the state of evenness. His life is completely transformed because he realizes the omnipresence of Brahman within himself and himself in Brahman. It is just like a river meeting the ocean. When a river meets the ocean, it becomes the ocean. Constant consciousness of Brahman leads the yogi to attain such a state. History reveals that many people of ill conduct were able to liberate themselves by becoming solely devoted to the Lord. Many such people, after complete self-transformation, have become well-known and respected sages. Having resolved all of their conflicts, even ill-behaved men can attain the height of equilibrium. Therefore, everyone has the opportunity to reform, imp reform, improve, and unfold himself. This is possible when one turns his mind inward 
and with full concentration and meditation attains a state of tranquility. Tranquil-minded people neither hate nor lust. When the human mind wanders in the grooves of hatred and lust, it becomes blinded by the pairs of opposites. But one who has attained the summit of equanimity behaves with evenness. He then performs his duty righteously, impartially, and in a non-attached way. Such a, such a sage attains everlasting peace and is not lost in the jungle of confusion. A true devotee of the Lord is in peace always. Verse 32 states that even the lowly born and people without much intelligence can attain enlightenment if they devote their lives to the Lord alone. The words lowly born refer to those who do not get much opportunity to study and learn and who do not have the means and amenities by birth. Those who do not have the opportunity to have a good upbringing can also attain the highest. Those who have already trodden the path in their past lives are born with certain virtues and samskaras that lead them again on the path of enlightenment. Then it is easy for them to accomplish or complete that which they could not complete in their previous lives. This lesson teaches all aspirants not to waste their time and energy in worldly pleasures. It is best for them to devote all their time to God in this mortal world of ours. A life devoted to the Lord is the best of all lives. That is the purpose of human birth. Let your mind be fixed on me. My devotee, sacrifice unto me, how unto me, bow unto me, intent on me, thus joining yourself in yoga, you will come to me, will, will come only to me. In other words, joining yourself with the realization of the one, of the Brahma, and that's called yoga. The last verse in this chapter can instructs the earnest aspirant to systematically attain the highest state of perfection. The mind should be wholly applied and devoted to the real self alone. The Lord of life seated in the deepest chamber of our being should be the sole object of meditation. When the mind is not allowed to roam around, but is focused on the Lord only, it is purified and becomes one-pointed and inward. When a meditative mind flows uninterruptedly to its object, it attains a state of tranquility, peace, and happiness. A consistent method of meditation, contemplation, and prayer, along with devotion to none else but the Lord, helps one to attain this state. Such an aspirant sacrifices all the fruits of his actions to the Lord of Lone, to the Lord alone. His mind, action, and speech are fully dedicated to the Lord. His aim of life is the attainment of the Lord. Such yogis are liberated. They attain the highest perfection and become one with the highest. Here ends that they had a typographical error when this was printed, so I changed it with the pen here. Here ends the ninth chapter in which the secret knowledge of the royal path called Rajavidya is imparted. There we go. Anybody have a preference for whether we pause here or go on to the next chapter? Somebody type an opinion in there. You want to go on or, or pause here for the day? Anybody have a vote? Type something in the box. Uh-huh. 
Pause, pause. Okay, dokie. Onwards, can we go on? We have one pause and two go on. I'm working on this here. I'm queuing up here. All righty, I'm going to hold one moment here. Let me see if this works, see if I'm figuring this stuff out here. All righty, with a little bitty, little bit of luck here. Okay. All righty. Let's hope here. There we are. How did that work? Here is chapter 10. The fourth paw. Johnny is waiting for the fourth paw. I don't know what that means. I'm missing the humor. I'm sure it's cute. I'll wait for the fourth paw. What is the fourth paw? Hmm. I'll have a sip here of this. The fourth paw. You're going to have to tell me about that. It's very rich material you've just gone through. Some of the best in the Gita. Yes, it is. Of course, it's all good. Pada. Yeah, the fourth pada. But, but yeah, I, I wondered that, Joel. But... Uh, but we are in the tenth, not the fourth. I'll wait for the fourth, Panda. Oh well, Johnny is. Uh, we we never quite know. Anyway, chapter ten: the glorious manifestations of the Lord. The blessed Lord said, "Furthermore, as if that's not enough. Furthermore, O mighty armed one, hear my supreme words." which I will tell you with the wish to benefit you, loving one, that, loving one that you are. The groups of gods do not know my origin, nor do the great sages. I am indeed the origin of the gods and of the sages, one and all. He who knows me as unborn and beginningless, great sovereign of the worlds, not confused among, from among human beings, he is freed from all sin. Can we hear a free? Yeah. I am hearing it all right now. Oh, pause. Johnny can't count, says Joe. <laughs> I don't know. That sounds like time for self-preservation there, Johnny. You've just been jumped. Free, says Scott. Yeah. There's another free. There's two frees. There's three frees. Boy, have we got frees going on. The profound teachings imparted by Sri Krishna gradually dispel Arjuna's doubts. The heart of the divine teacher is like that of a mother who always wishes for the well-being of her child. Jivan Mukti. Free, yes. Moksha, free, yes. But that word free has sort of permeated the satsang, and everybody knows that it means jivan mukti and moksha and all, but the word free, every time it's written here, captures some special attention, is what you're seeing there. It's not the absence of knowing the word moksha or the absence of the word 
Jivan Mukti. It's, it's just a simple language. It comes from Matri, who likes to use that word free, and then others have picked up on it. The, proud, the profound teachings imparted by Sri Krishna gradually dispel Arjuna's doubts. The heart of the divine teacher is like that of a mother who always wishes for the well-being of her child. Teaching an important truth, Sri Krishna says that even the gods do not know the mighty Lord. And the sages also cannot comprehend his majesty. The gods and sages are born from the highest Lord. The Lord, being father of all, is the father of the gods and sages. They are his children. The Lord existed with all his glory and majesty long before the gods and sages. Boy, there is a free for you, huh? Freeze, says Rojo. Now let's not freeze. And so, there you go. Joe is laughing. Joe, Joe is lolling, but he's not ruffling yet. Mm. The Lord existed with all his glory and majesty long before the gods and sages. A deep, uh, a de I get it, it's a deep free. A freeze is a deep free. Hmm. One who knows the truth realizes that the highest Lord of the universe was never born that he, using a poetic choice of words, that he is without beginning and end, and that he is eternal and infinite. True knowledge is knowing the Lord who is without beginning and end. He, again, poetic choice of words, he is eternal and perfect. He does everything selflessly for the spiritual unfoldment of all beings, and it is for that purpose that he manifests the universe. He is kind and merciful in looking after the welfare of even the smallest of creatures. Realizing that truth, the aspirant also leads a selfless life and serves those who are weaker than himself. One who practices selflessness becomes, here we go again, free or frees from all sin and bondage or moksha or jivan mukha. He becomes pure and liberated. The discriminating faculty, knowledge, freedom from confusion, forgiveness, truth, control, pacification, comfort, discomfort, being, non-being, fear, as well as reassurance. Nonviolence, equanimity, satiety, asceticism, charity, reputation, disrepute, all of these various kinds of situations of beings happen only from me. The seven ancient great sages and the four manus, my aspects were born of my mind whose progeny are all these worlds and people. He who knows this magnificence, vibhuti, and yoga in its reality he here becomes united with unshakable yoga. Unshakable yoga. We should trademark that and, and mark it unshakable yoga. Who's ever heard of that? All of the innumerable qualities. Yes, substitute the one for free, says Joel. For he, for he. All of the innumerable qualities such as intelligence and knowledge that exist in human beings arise from the ocean of infinity, the Lord himself, as do the seven seers and the four manus, lawgivers, who in turn give rise to all the creatures. These qualities are called bhavas, mental creations of the Lord. They are the manifestations of the glory of the Lord and the power that creates or manifests is the Lord's power. From the all-pervading mind of the Lord arise the mental entities. 
intelligence and knowledge are ever flowing streams from the ocean of infinity. The majesty of the Lord is displayed in the manifestation of the virtues mentioned in these verses. The aspirant who knows and is fully conscious that all manifestations arise from the Lord attains perfection. The yogi is he who is in union with the Lord. When the yogi knows that happiness and misery, success and failure, fame and infamy are the bhavas of the Lord and that all creatures possessed of these bhavas have arisen out of the Lord, then in all situations he maintains a tranquil mind. For such a yogi, every aspect of the universe is but an aspect of the mighty Lord himself. One who remains in union with the Lord remains fearless. Woe, Scott says, woe. Whoa, boy, that was a strong whoa, wasn't it? All righty, let's go down here. Next, I am the origin of all. Everything proceeds from me. Thinking thus, the wise, filled with the sentiment of devotion, devote themselves to me. Again, poetic choice of me for the absolute Brahman. Their minds absorbed in me, their pranas entering into me, enlightening each other, narrating about me. They are ever satisfied and ever delighted. That looks like some wows. I guess, I guess those wow symbols are the same as woes, aren't they? Their minds absorbed in me, their pranas entering into me, enlightening each other, narrating about me. They are ever satisfied and ever delighted. To them who are ever joined in yoga and who devote themselves with pleasure and love, I confer that yoga of wisdom whereby they come close to me, dwelling in their inner self to favor them out of compassion I destroy their darkness born of ignorance with the brilliant lamp of knowledge. The Swami Rama says, The Lord is the source of all manifestation in the whole of the universe. There is not a single object that is not dependent on the Lord as Brahma. The fundamental cause of all is the highest Lord. Knowing that truth, the aspirant fixes his mind solely on the Lord and dedicates his life to him. That dedication brings knowledge of the Lord to him, and he then imparts that knowledge to other aspirants. Such a devotee sings the praises of the Lord and always remains joyful. The aspirant who practices yoga without interruption secures that knowledge. Practice yoga without interruption. Pretty good idea, isn't it? He always remains in union with the Lord. The pure knowledge received from that union removes all ignorance and enables the aspirant to achieve anything and everything that is to be achieved. One who has firm faith, full confidence, and devotion to the Lord alone remains fearless, remains fearless, and carries out the sacred mission of the Lord. He has lifelong dedication to the Lord and gladly courts death while carrying out the divine mission. He walks on the earth fearlessly and gives the message of fearlessness to others. To impart that knowledge becomes his prime duty. He teaches the knowledge of the divine in a simple and lucid manner 
wherever he goes. He always sings the song of divine joy, which gives him the highest of happiness. One whose life is fully dedicated with mind, speech, and action to the Lord alone remains ever filled with divinity. Such a great one is called a perennial yogi. We could start a new yoga and call it perennial yoga. That would be cool, huh? His love of life is, to, is service to the Lord, and with his heart and mind full of love for God, he always remains in sadhana. Sadhana becomes his life. One who has attained this bhuti yoga, the yoga of pure reason, always remains in union with the Lord. He perennially enjoys the love divine. In the mind and heart of such a yogi, in the mind and heart of such a yogi remains the presence of the Lord all the time. Because of pure knowledge, ignorance does not exist at all. This is a very long one coming up here. I tell you what, I'm thinking here to pause here. We will compromise. It, we, we did not pause before, and we went a little into chapter 10, and this looks like a nice cliffhanger here, and and we'll, we'll pause and come back to this next time, okay? Here's the cliffhanger. You ready? Arjuna said, the supreme Brahman, the supreme abode, the supreme purifier are you, the eternal spirit, Purusha, the divine first God, unborn and all-pervading. So say all the sages and the celestial sages, Narada, Asita, Devada, and Vyasa, and you yourself are also telling me so. I believe that you are telling me to be true, O Keshava. Neither gods nor demons know your origin, O blessed Lord. By yourself alone you know yourself, O unexcelled spirit, O nurturer of beings, Lord of beings, God of gods, master of the world. It behooves you to tell me all your celestial magnificences, Vibhuti, by which magnificences you dwell, pervading all of these worlds. Ever contemplating you, how may I know you, O yogi? In what aspects are you to be contemplated by me? Tell me in detail your yoga and magnificence, O Krishna. Hearing this nectar-like speech, I am not satiated. So this is the cliffhanger, okay? There we go. To be continued, huh? It is okay, says, says Roseanne. And Scott said, yoga. Roseanne threw out a yoga. Yes. Thank you for playing, Scott. Thank you all for playing. To be continued. I know that the Bhagavad Gita is not new for any of us in, in this gathering. But it's fun, isn't it? It's pleasant to just go through this stuff over and over again. And I admit my own bias here because I just love the discussion from Swami Rama. I find I find that his, this not surprisingly, I find that his discussions are very, very much in alignment with my own natural intuition. That's not surprising at all, isn't it? I've never become brainwashed to my knowledge by anybody and and, and, and force myself to take on somebody else's belief. But and it's always seemed to me this is the way we should do this, have our own perceptions and, and then find that which matches. And this is always a match for me. I never, I've wondered from, from myself from time to time, you know, there's that question that said, if you had to be stranded on an island somewhere and you could only have one, one book, what book would you take with you? And I've got a few of them that I rotate around in, depends on what I'm looking at the time. But this is one of them, this particular rendition of Bhagavad Gita. 
the perennial psychology of the Bhagavad Gita because I love the orientation of it. Anyway, we're all familiar with Bhagavad Gita. So thank you all for playing. Thanks for joining, Raphael and everybody. Bye, friends, says Roseanne. Bye, all. I'll turn this back to this. You can have a big smiling face here and that's saying bye-bye. And remember, this is what we're looking for, the silence that is to be found after the Om. And this, of course, is the same as where is it? i got to get my finger up here to the little dot that's on the Om. The little dot on the Om is Turiya. And, of course, that's the meaning of our little question mark there. So please have a nice meditation and find it in the silence after the Om, okay? Thanks for visiting and playing all. See you next time. Tomorrow we've got, what do we have tomorrow? We've got some yoga sutras tomorrow and something else. I guess uh, another piece on the... Uh, Another piece on the sacred journey we'll do tomorrow. I don't remember exactly the sequence, but one is at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, ashram time, and the other is at 7 o'clock tomorrow evening, ashram time, which is central time in the U.S., which is the same as Chicago. So don't put us on the East Coast with Miami and all those other places over there. Anyway, we can call it ashram standard time. Huh? Okay. So I'm just babbling now. It's I get to the end and Matri likes to pick on me because I have a little trouble hitting the end broadcast button. That's what it's called here. The Facebook is called finish, but in the in the B Live, which is what we're using right now, it's called end broadcast. So I'm going to pretend that Matri is sitting here poking on me, telling me that I'm supposed to click the end broadcast button, and then I will push. Here it goes. You ready? Should I do a countdown? I don't want to do a countdown. Anyway, <laughs> bye-bye, Hashim. Hashim says, bye, all. Now Hashim is going to go sit in Samadhi for the rest of the evening, okay? Om Tatsa. Oh, finish. Oh, no, finish button. Yes, Roseanne knows what. Uh, Roseanne ha feels compassion for my situation. I'm just always reluctant. It might... My finger's going there, Roseanne. It's going to the end button. It's going there. I'm, I'm going to do it. It's the silence after the OM. There we go. OM.